we'll talk a little bit about immunotherapy in a moment, but I wanted to engage Dr. Weiss and just um, kind of introduce the concept because the, probably the latest biomarker that we're asking um, is the PDL1 status. And realizing, you know, getting back to your point about a lot of aspirations being done, almost all the PDL1 work, if not all the PDL1 work, is done on core biopsies. Um, which um, you know is a different strategy and not always uh, easy to do in patients. But give, give us your perspective on uh, PDL1 testing and, and, and the pitfalls. Sure. So I'll start with one thing that is not as much of a pitfall as people sometimes make it out to be, and that's quantity of tissue. Um, I think sometimes we talk about PDL1 tissue as if it were the newest, most advanced. Uh, next generation sequencing with some kind of bio, advanced bioinformatics. It's, an, it's a simple IHC, just like the TTF1 or P40 we were talking about before. And so tissue quantity is not always a problem in, in that sense. Um, on the other hand, the operating characteristics of this biomarker have been far more limited in real humans than they were in the preclinical um, studies. And that may have to do with the transition from complete surgical tissue um, in a sacrificed animal in the lab down to these core biopsies um, in the clinic. And what we're seeing um, is a very poor negative predictive value of the uh, PDL1 assay with variable um, positive predictive value depending on which company's test you're speaking of. And I think when you consider the FDA approved indications for these therapies at the current moment, which is second line lung cancer, as a clinician, I feel that negative predictive value isn't so helpful to me. Um, and I'm a little bit skeptical of just how well these really can be reconciled, how much this can be improved. There are some impressive efforts um, underway to try to understand the interaction between the different companies' tests. But at the core of it, PDL1 obtained by an FNA or a core biopsy may simply be a flawed biomarker. John, your perspective on PDL1 testing from the pathologist's point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I think PDL1, uh, we hear a lot about it, but the expression level is dynamic. It's very heterogeneous depending on the tumor type you look at. Uh, the expression will vary quite a large amount between the diagnostic biopsy that was taken and if a biopsy was taken at progression from a patient. Uh, further confounding it is we have multiple therapeutics available in the market, and each therapeutic has a uh, different biomarker test that's IHC based at this point that goes along with it. So we may actually be to, to the point uh, in the testing landscape where we actually have to do the specific IHC marker that is associated with a particular therapeutic, which would be unique in the companion diagnostic landscape for the past few years. I think the good news since we're discussing uh, non-small cell lung cancer today is the correlation for uh, non-small cell lung cancer samples with PDL1 antibodies seems to be very good. So we, this may be the best case scenario that we have for working with, with PDL1 antibodies. They tend to be much more variable with other tumor types. Uh, but right, right now we have a, a companion diagnostic with one agent in a... Um, Complimentary. Complimentary, thank you. I had a, <laughs> a block there for a second. Complimentary, which means it can provide information, yes. but it's not necessary. Um, are people using both of these antibodies in, in practice uh, to kind of figure this out? I mean, obviously, um, you know, I find in my practice that I don't necessarily use the biomarker clinically because uh, I know that there's activity if the biomarker is negative and I'm, uh, you know, I can use a drug, and we'll talk about this later, I can use a drug that's not linked to a biomarker uh, without having that information. At least we have one of them that, that is available. So, I mean, I, I, I think, and I'm going to come to the blueprint project, which Jared alluded to in a moment, but, but just in terms of how should we be thinking about this with two antibodies uh, out there? Right. It's interesting that you have a uh, complementary diagnostic and a companion diagnostic where one test is required for use of one therapeutic and is not required for the other. Yeah. So uh, I think prescribing patterns may be altered because of this. It may be a competitive advantage for one therapeutic versus the other if you do not have to have a biomarker test uh, to predict efficacy in patients. I think in the, oh, uh, actually, let's go over here, Jared, first. I think in the back. clinic it becomes a, more of a practical question. Uh, the data on both nivolumab and pembrolizumab are very impressive. I think uh, there's no clear distinction of one being more effective than the other. The advantage for nivolumab, as you were referencing, is you don't have to test. But for the patient that travels a great distance to come to the doctor's office, which for many of us 
um, at this table can be quite long, quite a far travel distance. The ability to use an every three-week therapeutic uh, as opposed to every two-week can matter for, for some patients. And so from a very practical perspective, that drives some testing. I just want to piggyback on quickly from a practical consideration, also a logistical consideration of, and, and how much tissue we may have left over when we're doing molecular interrogation and tissue that's needed for clinical trials. Is, do we have enough left over for PD-L1 testing? And well, we've had some yeah. challenges with that uh, yeah. in, our, in our institution, and I think that's institution dependent, but certainly I think there, there are, these are challenges. When well, we're yeah, about and this. I'm, I'm getting you know, Jared's point that currently these drugs are approved second line, so often you get there and all your tissue may be exhausted right. by that time. Greg, did you have a I, point? I just wanted to connect um, the two biomarkers we've talked about. We talked a little about EGFR and we talked a little about PD-L1, and, and it, it would be easy to get sort of to lump them together, that these are both biomarkers in the same way. But to, to piggyback on what Jared was saying, the negative predictive value of a pdl one test is pretty poor. You know, there's the response rate for the pdl one negative crowd is on the order of 10%. And to, to, we don't have a lot of data looking at EGFR mutation negative patients treated with EGFR TKIs looking at response rate. But the data we do have, the IPASS data looking at Patients with EGFR mutations and without, those patients who did not have EGFR mutations had a response rate of 1%. So gefitinib had a response rate of 1% if you didn't have an EGFR mutation, 70% if you did. That's a huge spread. That's a biomarker. That's what we need right. in this space. Right. So one of the other issues that um, I also get a lot of questions from community oncologists is the struggle with getting these tests done. You know, at our institution, they're done reflexively. If a patient has adenocarcinoma, you know, the pathologist on their initial signing out of the surgical path will say, here's the diagnosis adeno, there's plenty of tissue, it's submitted for molecular, addendum will be issued when the molecular is done, it's all done reflexively. At the community, I think a lot of community oncologists struggle with that, getting their pathologist to do it. Um, it may be done at a different hospital. You may not know the pathologist. The pathologist doesn't know you. You don't, can't figure out if there's enough tissue to do this, where to send it. Should we be doing it like ERPR? You know, we don't have to ask for ERPR her too, do we? Yeah, I think the ordering <laughs> patterns, particularly in the community, really vary, and uh, patients tend to fall between the cracks. Uh, wondering if the oncologist is going to order the biomarker testing or if the pathologist is going to order them. So I think any type of uh, reflexive setting you have um, really helps the patient in the end, and that's really why we're all here, because patients do respond quite well to targeted therapies, and we want to make sure that we do not miss testing opportunities predict to uh, predict if patients will be eligible for these therapies. And I think we're getting better at getting the message out to our tissue procurers, you know, the thoracic surgeons, the um, pulmonologists, the interventional radiologists, I think understand that in lung we need more. So they're actually cognizant of that fact. And I don't know how pervasive that is at the community level, but... Uh, Right, and I, I just think that it's, it's been years, right, that right. we've wanted uh, to know EGFR mutation status up front. I think it's really been in the community for five, six years at least that we want this information. So, and I think there's a lot of talk about how much time molecular assays take. And if we had reflex testing, nobody would care about time because it would it'd be happening before that patient even walked right. into the oncologist's office. Yeah, the clock would start 10 days earlier at the time of the biopsy That's versus right. start starting us now. So... Um, the other uh, point that I wanted to make is getting back to the PDL1 testing. Um, you know, some of the issues with that test have been: is it okay to use archive material? Do you need a fresh biopsy? Any any perspective on that, uh, John? Yeah, the the uh, concept of biopsy rebiopsy at progression really is emerging, particularly now that we have an approved therapeutic for T79N mutation, a primary resistance mutation, EGFR we're going to be doing a lot more rebiopsies to determine if patients are eligible for some of these targeted therapies. So, as I said, the pd one expression level is quite dynamic, and you would um, probably have a more accurate representation of the expression level with a current biopsy rather than going back to a diagnostic biopsy, which could be a year or even two years old at the time you want to do pd one testing. So I think it certainly would be indicated. Yeah, the, and, and, and I mean, you would th think that. The thing that was um, a bit comforting from that point of view is the data from Keynote 10, where the benefit of, uh, in this case, pembrolizumab, 
was the same whether they were archived biopsies or, or new fresh biopsies. So there, that suggests that maybe PDL1 status at the time of diagnosis may be adequate at, sure. at, at that point. So maybe we don't need to go back and do it.